Okay, here we go. I honestly don't know what to expect. Hey y'all, Dixie here. Today I want to talk to you about what actually happens when you push the SOS button on an inReach device. I'm sure most of y'all have seen my last video where I was extracted by a helicopter from the Sawtooth Wilderness area in Idaho. So you have a general idea of what happens when you call for help in the backcountry. And now I want to kind of dive into the things that I made a mental note of that I needed to share because I think that there's something to learn here in case any of y'all are ever in this situation. And in this, I'll probably sprinkle in some of the things that people commented or asked um, because if one person asked or assumed, then others probably did too. So on that note, what exactly happens when you push the button? Well, I flipped open the little cover and then mashed down, had to mash more than once. It counts down and then it looks like any other message that you send. It was like a little spinning thingy telling me that the message was trying to go through, but it's just a canned message like, hello, I am in need of help. And the message for me took several minutes to finally go through, possibly because I had been messaging with friends and family, telling them my situation, I was feeling worse. And so I feel like that might've clogged the line. There were some commenters that said, you have to put the inReach where there's a clear view of the sky. And yes, while typically at night, if I'm not in a, an emergency situation, then I just hang it on the loop of my trekking pole. But as soon as I pushed the SOS button, I stuck it outside my tent and it did have the clearest view of the sky that it could in that spot. There were trees all around, but if you look directly up, there was no canopy. So when your message finally goes through, Garmin will immediately call whoever it is you have listed as your emergency contact. So you need to keep that person in the loop and let them know what's going on with you so that way they can provide Garmin with information possibly sooner than your messaging conversation with Garmin. But I did get a response from the search and rescue team and Garmin contacted the local county search and rescue and then at some point I had, you know, my conversation with Garmin and then Boise County Search and Rescue then messaged me and started taking over with details. So because I think that my messages with Search and Rescue were delayed because of all the other stuff, my family being worried and messaging me, I think it's important to talk about this with your emergency contact and your family and friends that, hey, I've got this emergency contact. They are going to be contacted if something happens. Message them so that you don't slow down my communication process with search and rescue. So anyway, that is what I gathered from my side of it, but I felt like it would be helpful to hear my mom's take, who was my emergency contact. And I had forgotten that I'd even set that up, but anyway, I wanted you to have her firsthand account. First of all, I think I should say that you knew I was going out in the woods. So anyway, I hadn't told you that I wasn't feeling super great because no, wow. <laughs> the death look. The mom look. My phone starts ringing and I pull it out of my pocket and I look and it says Garmin International. And I thought, this is some sale call. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> you know, and then it hit me like a ton of bricks. And then, okay, I cry every time I tell it, so. I'm sorry, mommy. <laughs> so I answer it, and I remember the guy's name. He told me his name was Justin. And so he says, hi, um, is this Rhonda Mills? And I said, yes, it is. And he goes, hi, this is Justin. And he's trying to be calm. Yeah. You know. And so he said, um, um, is Jessica Mills your daughter? And I said, yes, she is. And he said, okay, and he goes, well, um, she has you as her emergency contact. <sighs> and she pushed the SOS button. So, at that time, I, I just felt like I couldn't breathe, and I just, I, uh, I just, I didn't know what to do. I just wanted to drop to the floor and cry. But I knew that I had to 
I had to be strong so I could help them help you. And he asked me, um, well, do you know what your daughter's been doing in the last few days or you know what she's out doing today? And I said, yeah, she's, she's out hiking a 60, oh, she's backpacking a 60 mile trail. And so at that point he, he couldn't give you any information No, because he didn't. Yeah. So he had just received the SOS push. And right. And he God, said, so you had no idea. No. What, like, oh my God. And see like, okay, so that's a lesson learned from my side of it because if I had just kept you in the loop, like, Hey, I'm yeah. not feeling so hot. Or, you know, if I had messaged you before I pushed it, then at least you would have known. And I, I could it. have told him even so yeah so so then I, I did tell him that well the messages have been delayed so um and it could you know that could be the reason and about that time he goes oh I just got a message from her and he said apparently um and then he starts telling oh, me oh I'm sure that made you feel well, better at that then at, at the time yeah yeah yeah, yeah it yeah. did and then I felt the buzz on my phone and I looked down and then I had a message from you too saying I haven't been feeling myself on this trip and blah 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 but you still didn't tell, tell me you that I was, the yeah. so he's telling me reading me his message he's receiving and then I'm reading him what I'm receiving okay and so he said that okay well, we have um we have her coordinates and we have um Boise County um we have them en route uh, to go get her. Okay. And so they, so that I was curious about that. So it sounds like they already sent them to figure something out, like right. immediately, even before they called you, like, hey, yes. go respond. But Garmin International, they, those guys are wonderful. Yeah. Because um, even though when he was going to hang up, he said, we will keep you updated. Any little news that we get, we will call you. That's, a, that's and awesome. And he said, also, feel free to call us, you know, if you haven't heard anything from us. Yeah. They were contacting the people on the helicopter and, you know, actually talking to yeah. the people on the helicopter. Well, that's what I was going to say. At some point, it seemed like you had more information than even I had, but I guess that's, you know, if you're going to have an emergency contact, you can't be afraid of worrying them. Like, they need to know what's going on. Let your emergency contacts, first of all, know who they are. And second <laughs> of all, let them know if you see a message from Garmin, answer it. Yes. But that's good that it shows up as Garmin. Yes. I will also say that um, once you got to the hospital, um, uh, Garmin gave me the name of the hospital the phone number, yeah, everything that I needed, and um, uh, they even told me what number to push, so I didn't have to s sit and what? listen to. Oh yeah, that's push incredible. How do they even know that? I guess they've been through it a few uh, times. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so. I'm glad you made the right choice and to push that button. Yeah, because I don't know. I mean, yeah. who knows what would have happened yeah. otherwise? And I think you so. you did really well thinking ahead and yeah. and. and realizing all that Trying stuff to, you know yeah. thank you i just didn't think ahead that i was gonna scare my mom halfway to death so. <laughs> don't well. do it again yes ma'am i will be <laughs> honest with you i love you mom i love you too <laughs> I, I, I was like they didn't see me i was like waving my tent you know it worked like, it totally worked did it? Okay. when we came and then made that la second time that loop around i was like i think i saw something but it was uh, it was just a blip. So the, when we came okay. back this couple other times, we're like, yes, people. she's there. Yeah. But he didn't have performance. And now, tips for being spotted by the helicopter. When the helicopter arrived and it first flew over, I was waving. And they had asked me what I was wearing. And I said a light blue top and, you know, whatever. I definitely see where having something bright colored comes in handy for search and rescue. And I think even for those people who are trying to be stealthy with their shelters, have something that you can display if you're in trouble. I waved my blue tent, but I realized the tent was a lot lighter than I thought it was. It really wasn't a super bright and catchy color. 
And the lady in the search and rescue crew told me that that color blended in with the rocks down below from their point of view, but that my moving it and waving it actually is what made her spot me because that motion caught her eye. If I had it to do again, I would have my emergency blanket that's the mylar, you know, looks like um, full to wave around or to lay out because I think the reflection of the sun or especially movement, that would have been catchy. Some people suggested a signaling mirror. With how fast that helicopter flies over, I don't feel confident that I could like point it in the correct spot. And then also if it was a cloudy day, I think um, still having that uh, emergency blanket would be a good redundancy if you are gonna carry a signaling mirror. The reason I did not have my emergency blanket is because I did the video a few months back of where I tested out my day hacking 10 essentials to see how comfortable or uncomfortable I would be at night and I just never replaced it. So always remember to replace your emergency stuff. Thankfully, when the search and rescue crew arrived, I had already made some trail friends who were sitting with me. And so search and rescue didn't come exactly to my spot. I walked with one of the fellas who carried my pack and the other one ran ahead to let them know like, hey, you got the right spot. She's right down here on trail. They immediately started asking me the scoop of what had happened. They took my blood pressure. They hooked me up to a heart monitor. And she did say that she caught some arrhythmias and some funky stuff going on with my heart. The pilot asked me about things in my pack. He asked if I had any firearms or weapons. I told him I had my knife. He said that was fine. He asked me about any fuel canisters or bear spray, which if you've ever tried to fly with any of those, you'll know that you can't. So unfortunately it broke my heart, but he took my fuel canister and put it on the trail right there by Hidden Lake. So if any of y'all Idahoans are out there backpacking and you see a fuel can in the middle of the trail, please don't cuss me. Uh, if you don't mind packing it out for me, I would greatly appreciate that. I just literally could not take it with me. And then once they got me all hooked up and strapped in, I apologized to the pilot for my stinky feet. And he told me that he's had worse feet up there next to him before, but the helicopter was really tight on the inside and a lot smaller than I had imagined that it would be. I don't know why I thought it would be more roomy, but anyway, it was really efficient the way that they pack everything in there and was really kind of cool to see. So yeah, it's just, you think, oh, it'll never, never happen, nothing. I mean, or not that it won't ever happen, but if it does, it'll be black and white <laughs> and you'll push the button, you know? Yeah. But. Probably one of the first things that I made a mental note of while all this was going down is how this search and rescue situation was not black and white to me in the moment. I had always felt like pushing the button when I needed to was going to be like the easiest thing ever because it would be just so very obvious that I needed to do that. I thought maybe my bone would be hanging out of my leg or I'd be bleeding out or something like that. So it was a very strange situation just knowing that it was not safe for me to continue 18 miles down the trail with my pack in that condition. It, it was just a hard spot to be in and wasn't what I had always thought it would be like. So as a continuation of that, it's normal in an emergency situation to feel embarrassed, but an emergency situation is no time to let pride get the best of you. I tormented myself for quite a while again because I felt silly that I was able to walk a quarter of a mile to the helicopter. They didn't have to carry me on a stretcher to the helicopter. Uh, but then I finally realized if somebody that I loved, a friend or family member was in this situation, I would have told them, are you crazy? Push the button. So if you find yourself in a situation where you're thinking, maybe I need to push this button, the answer is you do. If you're already considering it, then you do. And just remember me, I made a spectacle of myself crying uh, for everybody to see. And that's why I recorded that because I wanted people to know it's normal to, to feel scared and embarrassed to push the button. Sorry you're feeling the way you're feeling. I'm glad yeah. it's not worse. But yeah, I'm also, for sure. I'm also relieved that you called when you did and you didn't try to push well, on and make it really bad and then have thank to deal you with the same thing. for that reassurance because yes. I've been that's like so beating myself up like this no. is a lot of trouble. And if none of those things encourage you to push the button sooner, then know that waiting to push the button can make things harder on search and rescue. 
There were some comments that said, you know, how dare I have search and rescue come and waste their efforts on me instead of somebody who actually needed it. Or, you know, if I was able to walk, then why didn't I just walk to my car instead of troubling search and rescue when they could have been helping somebody else. But just so you know, if you continue to push on and then die or go missing on the trail, if you don't push that button and you end up really needing help, search and rescue is gonna have to come out there anyway. And when they don't have somebody that they're actively communicating on, then they're gonna be using a lot more resources and it's just gonna be more of a difficult hunt for them than if you push the button and you're able to assist them in getting you out of there. Every single person that I came in contact with, the search and rescue crew, the hospital team, all said thank you for pushing the button when you did instead of waiting for your condition to get worse because so often people wait and then they're really bad off or you know worst case not alive when they're taken out also keep in mind that search and rescue takes time i kind of felt like when i pushed that sos button that a rope was going to drop from the sky attached to a helicopter ready to scoop me out of the wilderness but in all actuality it was four and a half hours before they delivered me to the hospital and I feel like that was actually a really good time. Like that was impressive that they got to me that fast and got me out of there. Some people and some situations take much longer. So if you're not sure what your condition is gonna be in four or five hours, then don't wait. Some people have asked me what it actually feels like to mash that button. And it kind of felt like at the end of the movie Titanic, when older Rose, throws the heart of the ocean into the ocean, you know, and she's just like, ah, like, that's just, ah, that's kind of what it felt like. But I will say that I was always afraid that I might accidentally push the SOS button and that's not gonna happen. Cause actually the first time I mashed down on it, it didn't work. And then finally the second time it started doing a countdown. So it really makes sure that you're serious about pushing that button. So we called out and hopefully they were able to get back to you. Yes, they texted me. And yeah. So I, the communication has been awesome. Thank you. Like those work so, it yeah. honestly works so good. I have been on a number of cars where all we have is a set of coordinates. Yeah. I have no idea what's going on. And yeah, I beg, I beg of any of y'all watching, do not go in the back country without the ability to call for help if you need it. There are personal locator beacons that you don't have to have a monthly subscription for because they don't have the messaging feature and they are still not cheap devices. But although you won't be able to communicate with people, at least you'll have the ability to push the button and it will provide the coordinates of where you are to a team that knows that for some reason you need help. Apparently the iPhone 14 also has this feature now, which is pretty cool so if you're planning to upgrade then maybe you don't need to buy a personal locator beacon but they have some kind of feature that will connect to the satellites if you're in a search and rescue situation it will call for help and then apparently it prompts you with different questions that you select to try to give the search and rescue team a little bit more information about your situation but I really prefer the inReach mini or something like it that allows two-way messaging because I was able to communicate with the search and rescue team, give them information about myself, and then also communicate with them and be kept in the loop on what my rescue plan was. There was one point where the helicopter I thought hadn't spotted me and they just left and I was able to find out that they did see me and that they were planning to come back but they had to go drop off a crew member and some gear. And I assumed that they felt more comfortable landing with and taking off with less weight by that little lake in those mountains. Once they found out that they didn't need all of that extra gear because of you know whatever condition I was in. So once they picked me up, then we went to the field where they had dropped their crew member and gear and picked that up and then went to the hospital. So if I hadn't had that in reach device or some similar device to communicate, I'd have been scared that they just gave up or something. Also, I like having a device that allows me to communicate back and forth with my family so that I don't feel the need to rush because of the schedule that I gave them when to expect me out of the woods. So while I like the in reach mini, there are other devices out there that will do the same kind of things. There are spot devices, and to my knowledge, those always used to just send pre-programmed messages to folks that you had 
stored in to receive the messages just like hey made it to camp but they could see your location and see you were still moving apparently now there are spot devices that do allow two-way messaging so that's something to look into there's also a zolio gps device hopefully i'm pronouncing that right uh, that does two-way messaging it's a little bit heavier than the inreach mini uh, but there are pros and cons to everything it has the ability to give folks like an email and a number so they can actually initiate a conversation with you whereas with the inreach mini you have to send the initial text so folks know what number to message back apparently there is no screen on that device so the only way it will work is through the app on your phone i don't love that because then if something happens to your phone or it's dead or it breaks you can't message family and they'd probably get worried but you can still call for help so the sos button works without having your phone motorola has one called the defy satellite link i've read some mixed things on this uh, it's more lightweight than the inreach mini which is nice saving weight uh, the price is better as is the zolio but the thing that i've read that's on the con side of this device is the app is a pain in the butt for whatever reason so i'd look into reviews before you get any of these devices i'll put some links comparing some of these devices in the video description so if you want to read more about them and see which one works best for you and unfortunately i just like i don't know how much this is going to cost or whatever and i know i shouldn't be worried about that but so the biggest question in all of this is how much does it cost to be rescued from the woods and then treated at the hospital with no insurance I have gotten a bill from the hospital and that totaled out to around $2,000. I believe it was like $1,800. When I was lying in the bed at the hospital after coming out of the wilderness in the helicopter, I started researching what it might cost. And I did see that there are certain states like California, Idaho, and some others that have legislation in place where they can charge people, especially if they're doing something reckless. Um, but I wasn't doing anything reckless. I still feel like I'm gonna get a bill, but I guess that kind of gave me a little hope that maybe I wouldn't. And I also read that in national parks, they don't typically charge anything. I guess it's just paid with taxpayer dollars. So I think it just depends on where you are and what's happening when you get rescued. Unfortunately, my bill is not free. My helicopter ride is costing me $60,000. Thankfully, a few days ago, Aaron texted me with a screenshot of where he had gotten some sort of search and rescue coverage for when we were going to do the Arizona Trail. He said he was convinced that he was going to be bitten by a rattlesnake. Because he sent me that, I started thinking, well, did I not get anything back then for that trail? I guess not, and anything I got for Kilimanjaro would now be expired. But just as a Hail Mary, I searched my email to make sure that I hadn't gotten something that I had forgotten about. And it turns out I had a renewal email for a search and rescue type coverage through Garmin. And I logged into my Garmin account and thankfully it did renew back several months ago. It's an annual thing that apparently my past self five years ago when I first got the inReach decided to sign up for. And I am very grateful for that person back then, my five year ago self, that had the foresight to go, you know what, I'm gonna make sure this is an auto renewal thing as an annual uh, coverage so that if I go missing, you know, I'll have it. And I had 100% completely forgotten that I got that. At the time that I signed up for it, it was $29.95 per month and it covered $100,000 in expenses. Well, sometime over the years that changed and now only covers up to $50,000 and that is not medical expenses. The Garmin coverage is just for transporting you out of the woods. I did double check with them on that. So I am covered on my helicopter bill for up to $50,000 supposedly. I've started a claim with them. I am communicating with somebody, but we'll see where that goes. I had just signed up for health insurance, but I knew it was not gonna kick in until September 1st. So I was just four days out of luck on that one. So I am responsible immediately for about $12,000 in expenses for 
the medical costs and search and rescue. Going forward, I'm going to up my search and rescue coverage with Garmin to where it's $39.95 per month and it covers that $100,000 in expenses because I never wanna be in a situation like this again. Several of y'all have indicated that you would like to contribute to any expenses from this experience. And a few of y'all have already done so through Super Thanks and uh, PayPal contributions. So I really, truly appreciate that. But if there's anyone else who is interested, I will put a link where that can be done in the video description. So to not be in the mess that I am in right now, here are some of the plans that you can look into if you're gonna be in the backcountry. First off, if you do not go into the backcountry often, so maybe you take one hunting or fishing or backpacking trip a year and that's really all you do, then you might wanna look into something like World Nomads insurance for like a one-time just for that trip insurance because I put in the parameters of this trip and approximating that it would cost $2,000 worth of travel expenses and it spit out that it would cost me somewhere between $50 and $60 to cover this trip for travel expenses if something happened, medical expenses, and also search and rescue. Now if you have an inReach or other Garmin device with a membership, a messaging plan, then for $39.95 per year, it will offer you up to $100,000 in coverage for being extracted from the wilderness. So this makes sense if you have health insurance and you just want to cover the expense of a helicopter ride. Finally, the American Alpine Club has a coverage plan that costs $250 per year and it covers medical expenses up to $5,000 and rescue costs up to $300,000. So this one seems like it would be a good option for somebody who doesn't have medical insurance or if you just want that extra buffer. I do think now from personal experience that having that coverage is so very important, especially for your decision making while you're on trail, that peace of mind. Multiple folks wanted to know why I was recording what was happening or if I was in such bad shape, how was I able to? And one said, wasn't it a bit odd that I was recording all of this for views? Well, to be honest, I record all of my videos so that people will view them. <laughs> but I, I do understand this perspective a little bit. But what I invite y'all to understand is that I have been on cue to record my experiences out on trail and anything that happens. Like a lot of people said on the mountain lion video that I captured during my CDT through hike, how were you able to think about recording in that moment of fear? I mean, in that moment, I was literally afraid that I was gonna be attacked by a mountain lion, but I still was able to pull my phone out and think of that because it's something that's been practiced. It's a practiced reaction from when I first started backpacking on my through hike of the Appalachian Trail back in 2015. So that's been eight years that out on the trail, I'm like, oh dear, oh, mountain lion you know, whatever, just all of these things that I see, it's like, oh, how can I document this experience? So it was a very natural thing for me to just continue to document this in hopes that somebody could learn from this because I did not know what to expect with this whole thing when I pushed the SOS button. I mean, I had a general idea, but like step by step, I wasn't sure how it would go. And I thought, how awesome would that be for some of the fear factor to be taken out for somebody else who can watch this experience if they then find themselves in it down the line. But also talking to the camera to me has become like talking to a friend. So in my moment of panic and, and nerves, it was actually relaxing to be able to talk to somebody because I had been alone for three days at that point, except for running into like two people. So before I ran into the fellas who then sat with me and then one of them carried my pack, uh, just having somebody to talk to, even if it was a camera, felt comforting. One person commented and said that they felt like search and rescue would be annoyed with me recording the experience, but if you notice when I was recording, I didn't have the camera like right up in their faces. I just laid it, the phone on my chest and tried to catch what I could without hindering them. And then when I was looking out the window as we were flying off and we were talking about how pretty it was, um, they were actually like encouraging of me taking pictures and videos because they were like, well, at least you get to see the mountains even if it wasn't the way that you wanted to. So while sure, maybe some people would be annoyed these folks were not. Also, many of y'all wanted to know how I got the shot of the helicopter flying away 
while I was in it. And there were some folks who suggested that I was in cahoots with Garmin and the search and rescue team and the hospital staff for some kind of publicity stunt. Uh, but while I am flattered that y'all think that I could pull that off <laughs> or that I have the, the pool to get people to do that for me, uh, that is not the case. It was just simply the fellas who sat with me and then carried my pack to the helicopter. They took the shot for me and then emailed it to me when they got out of the wilderness. Do you want to stay with you? Uh, I think I'm okay. Y'all go ahead and enjoy sure? it. Yes, because yes. Because we're all we're doing, we're just doing a day hike. Yeah, I see. Where did y'all come from? Because I'm like Edna. Edna. Yeah, all our stuff's at Edna other than just. Oh, at... so y'all are like base camp. Yeah. I see. Yeah, gotcha. we're just heading up I was to... like, if there's a faster way out than all this mess, I was, you know, because I was hoping there was like some trail that you know you could cut through to get to a dirt road or something like that. But evidently, this is the the best way to do it. Because I was like, you know. 20 miles from my car right now. Yeah. Otherwise I would have just, you know, yeah. tried to. In the conversation that I had with those fellas, I think there was some confusion. People heard them say that they were on a six mile day hike. And so people were wondering why I said that I was 18 miles from my car when obviously if they're on a six mile day hike, I was only six miles from, you know, a road at least where maybe I could get some help. But that also was not the case. They had hiked in from a trailhead backpacking for a couple of days, and then they had set up a base camp. And so they were technically taking a zero on trail and just doing a day hike from their base camp. Since being home, I have gone to see my cardiologist who has put me on a 14 day heart monitor and has asked me, you know, to do all my normal stuff so he can try to capture anything going on with my heart. After I get this removed, I will have a stress test. And then we will go from there and see if he wants to do some cardiac electrophysiology study. I think that's what he called it. And uh, you know, just, he asked me to please not go backpacking until he can do a deep look into what's going on because he didn't seem confident that it was the medicine. Um, I still think that that's what it is, but I'm not a doctor and he said that if I am having any issues, he wants to know before I'm out there in the back country and get in the same predicament again. I really do think that experience or at least learning about something ahead of time can help make a stressful situation a little bit more tolerable. So I hope that running through this whole process with y'all, showing y'all what it was like will be something that you can have in the back of your mind if you ever find yourself in this type of situation. Just mentally prepping yourself for something can help you be more calm and having experience in different situations. For example, when I got released from the hospital, like I had already been through a really stressful day and thankfully thinking about, okay, now I got to get an Uber and now I got to find a hotel that also has uh, laundry so I can wash the clothes that I have on and just all of the things that I would need to live out of my backpack in a situation where I'm on foot. I already had that in my back pocket from all of the experience of through hiking. So that part of this experience was not as hectic as it could have otherwise been. I just invite y'all to remember that this type of thing can happen to literally anybody. Nobody is immune from mother nature and things that happen when you're out in the wilderness. So while it's really easy to Monday morning quarterback from a cool headed state of mind sitting in your chair or on your couch, when you're in a situation, you really don't know how you're gonna react or behave until you're in it. So I think that when you see people who go through situations like this, it's important to have compassion instead of so much judgment. And I know I've highlighted some of the comments that were not as encouraging as some others, um, but I just think that there's really, and I hate to use the word stigma, but maybe that's what it is, for pushing that SOS button and needing help and asking for assistance when you're in a tough spot. And I think that unfortunately that probably costs a lot of people their lives. So again, more compassion and less judgment. All right, y'all, well, that is all I have for you today. If you have any questions that were not covered in the last video or this video, feel free to leave those in the comments below and I will be happy to try to get to those. So again, I can help folks who might find themselves in a spot like this going forward. Thank y'all for watching and we will see y'all next time.